I meant biology. <clears throat> Chapter 14, The Origin and History of Life. I'll go over a few things. Now, if you notice that picture, that's definitely a part of one of the hypotheses of somehow a rock burned up into the atmosphere and created life. Mm, I think the beginnings of life happen on the star itself. In other words, it's the object below that burning rock that forms the life, if you'll see that. Number one, it's way, 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 way bigger. Number two, it's already green and it already has water. So clearly, scientists are kind of ignoring reality if they say that a meteorite brings life here. Come on, no. That's just ridiculous. Page 298, 14.1, Life's Origin Remains Mysterious. I'll read this out to you guys. Reconstructing life's start is like reading all the chapters of a novel except the first. A reader can get some ideas of the events and setting of the opening chapter from clues throughout the novel. Similarly, scattered clues from life throughout the ages reflect events that may have led to the origin of life. Scientists describe the origin and history of life in the context of the geologic time scale which divides time into eons, eras, periods, and epochs defined by major geological or biological events. Figure 14.1 shows a simplified geological time scale, and figure 12.2 for a complete version. 14.1 is right here. Notice the orange and yellow part. The orange is Hadean, and the yellow is Archaean. I don't know if you guys can see that very well. I'll go ahead and zoom it in for you. That is where Neptune and Uranus are right now. That's where they are right now. They're in their Archean and Hadean periods. They're forming life inside their interiors right now. They are Earth's in earlier stages of evolution. But as we will see, establishment has a different take on these kinds of events. The study of life's origins begins with astronomy and geology. It does. Earth and the solar system's other planets formed around 4.6 billion years ago as solid matter condensed out of a vast expanse of dust and gas swirling around the early sun. The red hot ball that became Earth cooled enough to form a crust by about 4.2 to 4.1 billion years ago when the surface temperature ranged from 500 Celsius to 1,000 Celsius, and the atmospheric pressure was 10 times what it is now. So at least they get a little bit more atmospheric pressure in there, and at least they get it is hotter. But little do they know, the very earliest, the earliest stages of life evolution happened when the star was very, very hot, and the first molecules were beginning to form. That happens during red and orange dwarf stages of stellar evolution. Because as we all know, Stars are where life begins, and stars are where life ends as well. Stars and life go hand in hand. They're intimately connected. They also go into Oprin's hypothesis of life beginning in an oxygen-depleted atmosphere, so the first amino acids and polypeptide chains and nucleic acids and lipids can form, you know, forming membranes and things like that. But one thing I wanted to also point out here is that the prebiotic chemistry of the beginnings of life is obviously ignored because of biologists and chemists. Well, let's just be honest here. They're very myopic. They only see what's right in front of their faces. They don't have the vision required to connect the dots like a lot of my listeners have. They have a lot of vision. So here we have on page 301. You have prebiotic chemistry on the first slab, then you have the pre-RNA world, which is polymerization, you know, when the chemicals start getting longer and longer chains. You have your RNA world, you have enzyme uh, copies of RNA, ma enzyme making copies of RNA and complementary DNA. And you have your DNA and protein world, and you have your primordial cell when the membranes start enclosing a lot of the organelles and things like that. But on the first one, it says, prebiotic chemistry. Prebiotic chemicals react to form small organic molecules in a watery environment or soup. That's right there. You guys can see that. That's the first stage. 
And for those more astute of my audience, I'm sure you can see where the myopic nature of the assumptions lay. They assume that these chemicals only exist inside of a watery soup. Well, being that evolution or stellar evolution itself leads to life itself, you have to form the chemicals first via exothermic reactions. You have your carbon combined with the oxygen releasing heat. You have your hydrogen combining with hydrogen releasing heat, making hydrogen gas. You have hydrogen combining with oxygen releasing heat, making water. You have carbon combining with four hydrogen, making, I think that's methane. And you have nitrogen combining with three hydrogens, making ammonia. And those chemicals exist inside of the evolving stars, Neptune, Uranus, Jupiter, Saturn. Meaning, the organic molecules to begin the process of life form not in a watery soup. They form in a plasmatic slash gaseous mixture where the molecules actually have enough room to bounce around and to interact with each other. No water is even needed to form the beginnings of life. And that's a very important point I wanted to bring across that I think geologists ignore because they're myopic. They can't see into the future. They look at astronomy and geology and look at their departments and say, well, you guys have to know what you're talking about because you studied this for 100 years. No, they don't. They don't realize that stellar evolution is the process of planet formation itself. And they don't realize that the hypothesis of stars being... Or Earth being like similar to an early star was made by Operin and even Lord Kelvin himself. They just outright ignore that kind of stuff. So I just wanted to point that out to you guys. And if you have any, um, I even have the Miller Urey experiment on this page where they overview a lot of Operin's ideas. But basically, the beginnings of life happen inside of uh, late stage stars. And to think that early Earth was always solid and liquid material is completely false. But that's the kind of attitude they have because the astronomers and geologists are not giving them vision. You need to give the biologists and chemists vision so they can take their hypothesis and bring it to the next step. But the astronomy and geology departments, they're not, they're not leading, they're not leading the right way. They're not teaching people that you have to look outside of the box, outside of what everybody else believed in the 1920s, 1930s, 1940s, and through the 70s and 80s. You have to take yourself out of that mentality and really stretch your mind into what's actually possible. Today is October I think, 10th, 2015. Everybody have a good day.